Welcome. Did you have any idea that one out of every eight people who die on this planet each year, we're talking seven million people, die as a result of air pollution? This according to a UN report just released. It's double previous estimates. We'll get a better understanding of this and the local implications in a moment, but also on today's program, the Domino Sugar Affordable Housing Deal is the development that will rise in place of the iconic Brooklyn factory the template for New York in the time of de Blasio in our public intellectual segment where we look at new research with the power to change our minds and public policy. We hear how high stakes testing divides the classroom and the teacher's attention. And toward the end of the hour, a high line for Queens, varying visions of a linear park. First though, air pollution's deadly toll, says the World Health Organization there's a stronger link to heart disease and stroke than was thought, and more than half the deaths are from bad indoor air. So are we addressing the air pollution problem fast enough, seriously enough, worldwide and locally? Is New York the shining example of cleaning up the air? Joining us, Dr. Thomas Mate, New York City Department of Health Assistant Commissioner at the Bureau of Environmental Surveillance and Policy. Dr. Mate has directed Health Department and Plan YC studies exploring the impact of air pollution and extreme heat, and Professor Patrick Kinney, Columbia University Climate and Health Program Director. He studies the intersection of global public health, climate change, and air pollution. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for coming in. I know you've both got great expertises in local air, uh, but Dr. Kinney, I want to ask you first about this World Health Organization study twice what they used to think in terms of the contribution of air pollution to premature deaths? Well, the science and the understanding of the links between air pollution and health have, have advanced since the last time the WHO did this, about 12 years ago. Um, and so it's not surprising that the numbers would have changed. It is a little surprising how much they went up. And, but when you look at the, you, you sort of dig under the hood, you can see why. I think for the indoor air quality one, it's exactly as you said, the cardiovascular and stroke out outcomes weren't, weren't previously linked to indoor air pollution, and now they are, and that really adds a lot. That sort of doubles it. For outdoor air quality, it's, it's mainly uh, the expansion of the, of the former analysis to more regions, I think, of the world. It's going to surprise a lot of people to hear that indoor air causes more deaths than mm -hmm. outdoor air. We might typically think of, oh, it's a smoggy day outside, stay indoors to protect your lungs. What is all this indoor air pollution around the world? Well, your advice is, is good for a New Yorker, but if you're living in uh, rural parts of Africa um, where they cook with wood or dung or some kind of dirty fuel, and not just in Africa, but in many parts of the developing world, then the air indoor air quality is really, really much worse than outdoors. What about New York? Indoor air, a big cause of premature death or illness? Well, <coughs> indoor air in places where people smoke is is uh, not in the aggregate a bigger cause of death, but it's certainly very important. And, and that's why New York City acted to uh, you know, restrict smoking in public places. And besides smoking, which we all know about. Uh, you know, there's, there are important uh, indoor air quality issues that affect uh, health, like um, pests, for example, that cause allergens that affect children with asthma. That's a, an important indoor air quality problem. Um, and even in, in housing, you know, where people smoke, uh, Secondhand tobacco smoke can be an important uh, source of indoor air pollution. But generally, I think uh, it is true that when the outdoor air quality is bad, um, you can take, Stay inside. you can take, well, especially if it's ozone, which is still a problem in New York City, being indoors with the windows closed, if you have air conditioning, the air conditioning on, you'll lower your exposure uh, tremendously. But that's assuming you're not smoking. <laughs> but again, these global numbers that went up so much, is it from better reporting and science? Is it from a better understanding of what's making people sick and even killing them from indoor and outdoor air around the world? Or is the death rate from air pollution getting worse? Uh, I'd say it's mostly about better understanding of the linkages and better tools for modeling those linkages than we had before. So that, you know, that science advances and in 10 years things have changed a lot. We understand a lot better the impacts of both indoor and outdoor air pollution on, on premature death. And what are some of those linkages? Just give everybody an example. If we're talking about more deaths from heart disease and stroke uh, than previously realized as pertains to air pollution, mm. what happens? Well, uh, it turns out that 
fine particles in the outdoor air behave very much like fine particles in cigarette smoke do in terms of their impacts on the lung. Of course, the outdoor air concentrations are far, far lower than what a cigarette smoker gets, so it takes a much longer time for the same kinds of changes to occur. But basically, the cardiovascular, the changes in the cardiovascular system that, that we know about that smoking affects, uh, we're seeing the same kinds of effects for, from air pollution. It takes longer. You know, and, and not everybody's affected, but it definitely t makes you know a toll over time. He mentioned fine particles. That's a big category of air pollutants. Fine particles actually represent a major success story with respect to New York City air over the last few decades. Isn't that right? Right. It, uh, fine particle levels have been falling really since the late 90s when they were first they first really began to be regulated by the EPA. These are fine particles in the outdoor air that we can't see, not caused by cigarettes, but right. they, they get breathed in and affect our lungs and our hearts. Yes, they, they basically, uh, they're a certain size, so they're a size that penetrates deep into the lungs and they, in, they cause inflammation and other changes in both the airways and in blood vessels. Does that mean the soot that we can see coming out of chimneys and stuff is actually less dangerous because they're big particles and they can't get all the way in our airways? Uh, when you see soot coming out of the chimney, it's a mixture really of large particles, some of which uh, settle out more quickly, and the small particles. So when, if you see a, a chimney smoking, there's fine particles in the smoke. I would also say that you can't see an individual fine particle. They're too tiny, but in aggregate you can definitely see them. So the, the plume of black stuff that comes out of a really dirty diesel vehicle that's all fine particles, and you can definitely see it. You know, once it gets distributed and dispersed, you can't see it. Also, in a hazy day, when you look across the New York City skyline and you can't see the buildings very well, those are fine particles. So you're here's, not. Here's yeah. an example of how far we've come in New York City. Here's a slide of the George Washington Bridge in 1973, <laughs> such as it is. A governor could cause a traffic jam, and no one would be able to tell because you can't see in front of your bumper. Um, what's uh, uh, I, I feel like we don't see days like this very much in New York anymore, correct? Right, that's correct. We, we, <coughs> air quality is much better than it was in the 1970s, you know, thanks uh, in large measure to the Clean Air Act. So there was a lot of momentum towards cleaner air uh, going into the, the 2000s, the turn of the century. What's the nature of the pollution in that slide that was just on? Is it easy to say? Well, the, the obs obscurity that, that, that's making it hard to see is those are fine particles, little tiny particles that not only can penetrate deep in your lungs, but also are very good at scattering light and making it look like a fog, basically. And so it's from different kinds of oil, you were telling me off the air, different kinds of fuel sources in general, uh, regulations on coal-fired plants in the Midwest, whose pollution actually floats here on the wind, all of those things contributed to cleaning up New York City air? Absolutely. Uh, it's a, it's a f mainly fuel combustion related pollutant. Uh, some parts of the country they have problems with wildfires can contribute to uh, particle pollution and as uh, Dr. Kinney mentioned, uh, indoor air where people are burning uh, wood or uh, other biomass, that produces fine particles. Now I understand you study the relationship between global warming uh, or those kinds of emissions that contribute to global warming and pollution down here at ground level. And I think we usually assume these are unrelated things. Mm -hmm. Global warming is spewing carbon mm -hmm. into the atmosphere, which is warming the air, which is causing sea level rise and those mm -hmm. kinds of problems. Not the kind of choking air pollution that we generally uh, associate with other kinds of pollution. But there's a relationship? There's a very close relationship, actually, because the mo many of the same sources that emit the carbon pollution that affects the climate are also emitting uh, ozone and fine particles that affect our health directly. And that's, I think, been a motivation for localized control to, to do good things for the climate, but at the same time do good things for local citizens by cleaning up the air. And are there solutions that would have the biggest impact here and in Beijing, which is, I think, our current icon of a polluted city right now? Well, the, the, the levers differ in different, pla different places, but in New York City, you know, I think what we can do is keep keep cleaning up the vehicles and also the, the heating oil that's uh, contributing to our fine particles locally. Here's and if we Beijing, do that, by the way. Here's Beijing from the air. That looks like a clear day in Beijing. <laughs> really? Yeah, this is relatively. not 1973 at the George Washington Bridge, but this is today. Yeah, that's a typical day in Beijing, yeah. Is it the same kind of stuff we saw in that historical shot of New York 
it all looks like smoke to us. Is it the same kind of pollutants? Uh, there, there probably are uh, some relative differences in the mix, but it's, uh, I would say, similar. Um, uh, you know, in general, it's fine particles from fuel combustion. Coal is probably uh, much more important in Beijing's air quality problem, but they also have a problem with emissions from vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think fundamentally it's a similar problem. And I think uh, also uh, the solutions are going to have to take a similar path to um, what was done in this country and what's being done, you know, national, regional, local strategies to uh, mm -hmm. reduce emissions. Um, cleaner fuels, uh, better technology, better efficiency, all of those help to reduce the combustion emissions. For both of you, Dr. Matei first, how about neighborhood to neighborhood differences within New York City? Does poverty correlate with higher air polluted uh, neighborhoods? Uh, poverty in New York City correlates with the impact of air pollution because uh, neighborhoods with a more social disadvantage have more vulnerable people living in them. But the air quality itself in New York City, it's interesting, it's a difference from some cities. Uh, many affluent people want to live in the neighborhoods that are the most built up, have the most tall buildings, have a lot of traffic. And so the air quality is actually um, very poor in some of the more affluent neighborhoods in New York City. Um, so if you think of, say, the Upper East Side uh, and East Harlem, that divide at 96th Street, the, the pollution that's being emitted from buildings and vehicles doesn't stop at 96th Street. The air quality may actually be a little bit worse in the Upper East Side, but um, the health impacts of air pollution depend on the air pollution, what it does to people, and how vulnerable people are that live there. What would you add to that? Uh, I would completely agree with what he's saying. That um, uh, what, w One thing that's really nice about New York City, though, is we actually can, can trace these fine-scale uh, concentrations of pollution because we have a very extensive monitoring network that I think is unique in the country at the moment. So we're able to we're able to see which neighborhoods are hot spots and and then what to go after to try to clean those places up. The high rises in the well off areas. This is a little counterintuitive, right? I mean, I think in the De Blasio era era we're going to be focusing even more on high rise development, dense development, and ironically as an environmental measure to some degree. So people live around train stations, concentrated around right. mass transit, mm -hmm. so that fewer people drive, causing less air pollution. Yes. Uh, interesting. You know, there is sort of a paradox. A city like New York, which is, um, it wasn't really developed the way it was because of concerns about climate change, but it affords a, a potential for a less uh, fuel combustion intensive lifestyle, let's say, because of making it possible to have a lot of people using public transit, uh, having small, you know, living in an apartment rather than a 2,000 square foot home. But at the same time, it brings people together in close proximity to where there is fuel combustion. So it can, you know, make exposure for some people greater. And what that means really is uh, we need in places that are developed like New York City, we need to take additional measures beyond what might be uh, acceptable nationally mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we're getting emissions to the lowest possible level in these very densely populated neighborhoods. Carbon aside, does it matter to New York if Beijing and other global polluted cities clean up? Does it matter to our breathable air? Uh, actually, there is long-range transport of the pollution from China that comes across and, and does impact on air quality in, in North America. It's not a large effect for sure. But um, I think for people who are doing business in Beijing and have to travel there, for sure, it's, it matters. Um, so I think, I think Beijing cleaning up their air, you know, they should do it, and it'll be good for them, and it'll, you know, it'll be good for us as well. Are they doing it? And do they need our help? And if what used to mm -hmm. be the factory manufacturing economy in the United States has now migrated there right. and other, you know, southern hemisphere cities, um, or I guess China isn't necessarily southern hemisphere, but developing world cities, um, do we have a role to play? I think so in terms of technology transfer and, and giving them advice about the smart way to do it, um, for sure. And um, also to train their scientists so that they can do their own studies locally and, and build the scientific basis that will allow them to set their own standards in the ways that are most appropriate. I think we can, we can help train them as well. Dr. Kinney, Dr. Matei, thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. Glad to be here.
a climactic real estate deal is in the works. The old Domino Sugar Factory in Williamsburg, Brooklyn will come down. A high-rise complex will take its place, reshaping the East River shoreline. The de Blasio administration let the developer, Two Trees, build bigger in exchange for more affordable apartments. The steel is popular, but raises concerns about architecture and neighborhood preservation. Only 2% of the city is landmarked, only 10% of Manhattan, and warns our guest it isn't just a high-rise problem. You can Manhattanize a brownstone neighborhood without changing one facade. Our guest is Christabel Goff, founder and secretary of the Society for the Architecture of New York City. Welcome, thank you for coming. Well, thank you, and thank you for being interested in Manhattanization. Vocabulary is, word, uh, Manhattanization. It's a mean? new word. It's barely in the dictionary. And I don't know what we've done. Manhattan, it used to be something that everyone loved. Remember the 20th century songs? Wonderful Town. Woody Allen movie. Yes, but now Manhattanization has become a bad word. It is a critical word. It suggests too much density, too much uniformity, and a problem with the redistribution of wealth, I think, which is cardinal to that problem. So is Williamsburg already an example of Manhattanization? Oh, absolutely, will yes. Will the Domino Sugar Factory high-rise, even with affordable apartments, make it more so? Yes, because the, the rezoning of Williamsburg, which was intensely unpopular in the area, I remember I went and tried to testify against it. The line of people who wanted to testify against it went all the way around City Hall Park. They never got in to speak. The Bloomberg administration didn't care. They're going to do it. They did it. And many, many towers have been built uh, along the coast. Here, here's the latest one, which is, of course, gigantic, as you say. And there will be affordable housing. And when the, the one part of, of the, the one building of Domino, the central factory is protected by landmarking. Most of the rest of it isn't. When oh, that so there's still going to be something there that looks like the old sugar factory? There is going to be something there that looks like the old sugar and factory. It's going to have something on top of it that's going to change, and the surrounding context is going to change totally. Yes. But something is left. There's a limit to what landmark preservation can do, unfortunately. And I think that those limits have been exacerbated by the transfer of wealth to that famous 1%. But I think there are three different interests here, and yes. correct me if you think I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but there are the developers yes. who want their profits. There are the affordable housing advocates who share your concern about gentrification and everything being for the 1%. And then there are the preservationists who you represent who care about the scale of the neighborhood, the old time feel of the neighborhood, quality of life in that respect. And I'm not sure you and the housing advocates are on the same page anymore because I think they and de Blasio have reached a deal that dense is good, high rise is good, if that's the key to more affordable housing. Am I wrong? I think I might have to disagree with you. Uh, the, the, the real estate board has tried to drive that wedge, in my opinion. With their, with their publicity. Uh, they, they try to claim that you can't have affordable housing on any scale in historic districts. Now, this is a gross exaggeration. Historic districts have many places where new, new buildings can be built, and in many districts, sizable new buildings can be built, let's say in Soho, Ladies Mile, at Gansevoort. There, there are larger buildings going up all the time, and there is absolutely nothing to stop them having affordable housing in them. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a false dichotomy that they, they, the real estate board has been wanting to modify the, landmark, the landmarks law since 1988, But there's for sure. nothing to incentivize them to have affordable housing, is there, unless they can build higher? Because if they're in these preserved areas, these historic areas, won't real estate values on their own skyrocket because they're desirable and they're not dense neighborhoods? Well, it, let's take Soho as an example. A lot of the buildings in Soho are large. I mean, there are brownstone historic districts and there are commercial historic districts. And in places like Soho, which are now residential, originally they were manufacturing, you, you can build very sizable buildings under, under existing law. There's, there's I, I think, not a conflict. If you get into a brownstone neighborhood, mm -hmm. 
the real estate board can't do an assemblage. That is, they can't buy 10 brownstones, knock them all down, and start again. Right. No, that they can't do. That's almost the only thing they can't do. So what neighborhoods are you concerned about next? Next? I'm concerned about all of them. I'm sorry. I'm from Greenwich Village, where we see another side of the wealth problem. Greenwich Village used to be a lovely neighborhood full of all kinds of different people, artists, workers. It, I, th I think it was when Kenneth Lipper first bought a little house on Bedford Street and tore it down except for a very small part of the front, which was deemed to be protected. What people have been doing, and I monitor the Landmarks Commission. I'm down there every Tuesday. I've been doing that since 1983, so I see all this happening. What people do, they buy a townhouse, they protect the facade, which is protected, and to some degree, the back, and to a considerable degree, the height that you can add on top of the roof. Mm -hmm. But inside, mm -hmm. they gut it. They have their great room, they have their atrium, they have their underground swimming pool, they have their amenities, their lobster tanks, and their dog grooming rooms, and their projection rooms, and all those things that people feel they and need nowadays. And is that the public's business, what somebody does behind the facade of their brownstone? It absolutely isn't. That's the point. The Landmarks Law does not regulate interiors that are not normally accessible to the public. And it but was it thought at the time that the law was written that it couldn't be done in America. In, but in therefore, some European it becomes for a, malt, uh, for a, a wealthier... Uh, population, is that your concern? That's my contention that the wealthy populations are coming in, tearing everything out. You can take, if you buy a house that has rent stabilized apartments in it, you can turn out the tenants and take it if you take it for yourself for a single family home. That's a different law, but that, that's what happens. So a number of brownstones that used to have, what, four, five, six little apartments that real people lived in, uh, they, they can be turned out, and the whole thing can be gutted and turned into a fashionable interior for one family. And you have a sense that something greater is being lost here, right? This is not just the economics of affordable rents or affordable homes for sale. I think diversity is being lost, neighborhood diversity. I think people are being driven out. I know numerous people who have left Greenwich Village who used to live there. I I'm considering doing it myself, actually, because it's just not the same old village anymore because the different people, the restaurants change, the shops change, the, the whole character changes, except for the facades, which are perfect, and people who don't know the neighborhood, they walk down the street and they think it's beautiful, and it is. How much can one stop, how much do we want to stop neighborhood change? I think that I'll just stay with, I don't think we can. <laughs> do I want to? Probably, yes. Yes. But also, the 1% are only 1% of the population. So how could they be taking over neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood? Because they're all here. Because they only need they want to be of the here. homes. No, they want to be here. Where's here? Uh, Manhattan. Thus, Manhattanization. They want to be in Manhattan, and there are areas of Brooklyn now where they want to be very much also. So what is it about? Is it about commuting time or otherwise? What's wrong with other parts of the city becoming for the other 99%? Well, it's a huge city. You said that 2% was landmarked. Actually, I think it's more like 3%, okay. but it's tiny. Sure. Yeah. So they have the whole world before them in terms of finding places to build. But fashionable neighborhoods, which were made desirable by architects who designed beautiful buildings, by builders who built rows of brownstones that people adore, Th those are desirable, and they can afford it, and they are coming. And it's not only in historic districts, but there's now the real estate industry is looking to privatize, build on top of schools, build on top of libraries, take down libraries and build above them and put a library in the basement. We have the pending sale of the Mid-Manhattan Library. They, the trustees and management of that library want to sell and destroy the Mid-Manhattan Library. They want to gut the Central Library. They want to take out the stacks and the books and build within it, designed by Sir Norman Foster, uh, another Mid-Manhattan Library, which will be smaller, have fewer books, and uh, 
many people have regarded this as a real estate deal because major, major real estate players and hedge fund owners are uh, the trustees of the New York Public Library and they have the ability, they have the governance to make decisions like that. We are trying to persuade them not to do that. And the library, I think, wants to use the space in a different way. They certainly do. <laughs> More ability to have people use the space for um, work and research and things like that. And they would argue if you have to order the book from across the street or across town and it takes a day or from home, Princeton. Well, not the, or from Princeton even, that not that many people use the stacks anymore. Maybe it's better use of the space in midtown Manhattan. Well, you, you have that, that is the key to it. The, those people feel that storage of books is not a good use of valuable real estate. But uh, selling a, a library building is a good use of valuable real estate. It's uh, not, I, you, you have obviously heard the arguments. I, I don't think they hold any water at all. People have been filling the Rose Reading Room all the time it's been there. If, since, since 1910. I, I mean, not that it was called the Rose Reading Room then, but uh, people love that library. I, I have myself been outside it with Citizens Defending Libraries, handing out leaflets about what the trustees are doing, and people are just appalled. People look at me, when I say they're selling the mid-Manhattan, people look at me as if someone had died. It's so depressing. I don't even want to do it anymore. <laughs> Carolyn does it bravely, but she goes on. People, people are extremely upset about this. 15,000 people have signed a petition against it from readers and users. There's now 2,500 signers from academics and authors. And there are Pulitzer Prize winning biographers and novelists and really very well known people. The trustees just don't seem to care. Back to, <laughs> back to high rises. Okay. Have other cities done it better? Is there a Parisization of Paris and its suburbs, or are there cities that have managed to prevent the loss of the feel of the city, even while modernizing the housing, creating more affordable housing, accommodating the, the bubble of the 1%? Paris has, has done that, as, as, you, as you rightly said. Washington, D.C. has done that to some extent. In, in fact, actually, much to my amusement, Jean Nouvel, uh, who was brought in to design one of these non-existent new buildings in Soho, uh, came in and the, the preservation consultant, who was rather real estate inclined, explained that this was really incredibly contextual. And I had done some looking up, and it turned out that it was really a dead ringer for a building that she had built for housing outside Paris. Huh. <laughs> right. It didn't matter, no one cared except Mr. Newfell, and I think I gave him a bad five minutes, <laughs> but the, the building was approved. But what did they do in San Francisco, which is another one, Washington, Paris, to avoid this fate? Height limits. Height limits? Yeah, That's I believe, thing. zoning. Yes, it's through zoning. Uh, I, th I think it's kind of too late at this point. We have so many towers, and it's so dense in midtown Manhattan. Not that it can't get worse. Look at 57th Street. And another... About to get higher and denser. Hugely, hugely. It, the things are just being approved. I have a friend who left New York, who lived on the Upper East Side in a neighborhood of Towers in Yorkville. And he said, it's, it's kind of scary at night. You look out the windows and there aren't any lights because so many people have bought these apartments as investments and places to park their money from other countries. New York. And they're not taxpayers. at night because of all the rich people who aren't occupying their apartments. I said that. I, I actually... I <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Up next, our public intellectual segment. A new study suggests teachers pay less attention to the neediest kids because they're not likely to lift classroom scores on high stakes tests. I'm Brian Lehrer, time for Public Intellectual, where we examine new research with the power to change our minds and public policy. A new study in the Journal of Sociology of Education looks at data from Houston, Texas, the city independent school district there, and finds that the pressure of high stakes testing on teachers 
think uh, No Child Left Behind and Common Core leads to classroom triage. What's that? When teachers focus on the students closest to just passing the tests, paying less attention to the top or bottom tier of students. The author of this study is Jennifer Jennings, an assistant professor of sociology at New York University. She was also the mysterious author of the blog Edu Wonket, which education <laughs> activist Diane Ravitch once called the most popular education blog ever. So before we talk to the real Professor Jennings, let's see a moment of an animation oh that boosts her blog. By day, she's an education researcher slaving away in the ivory towers of academia. But by night, she's... Sticking up for the little guy, singing truth, writing spin, and leading a struggle for equitable educational policy based on the latest in quantitative and qualitative research. She has no super speed, no super strength, no x-ray vision, her only weapon, her blood. Stay tuned for more in the adventures of And you won't catch! And here she is, the real life, Professor Jennings, Edgy Wonkett. Hello. Hi, Brian. How old was that animation? Um, that was 2008. Did you publish your blog anonymously, or did people know who you were? Yeah, so when that came out, I was still anonymous. Um, but after a number of different um, colleagues started being blamed by the Bloomberg administration for um, doing these nefarious activities, I had to come out. Um, so they weren't, you know, Why was punished. the Bloomberg administration upset? Where were you going with it? Yeah, um, so a lot of what I did on the blog, I thought as a graduate student was very uncontroversial. Um, so in so far as another anonymous graduate student with another anonymous blog didn't seem to me to be a big deal. But what I did was take, you know, data that the city was releasing and then use the tools that I was being trained in in graduate school to try to understand whether or not the claims that the press office was making or that the mayor was making um, kind of held up when we looked at the data. And you found no in what kind of case? Um, so, I mean, so just to be clear, there's a lot of variation across different cases. I don't think there's one story. Um, something like uh, the achievement gap closing in New York City. So there is a lot of talk around black-white achievement gaps, Hispanic-white achievement gaps closing, but when you actually look at the data on a range of tasks, there's actually no evidence that's happening. It was only on the proficiency rates, um, the percent of kids passing that was actually closing. They did get the graduation rate Absolutely. from 2005 when it was like 45%. Mm -hmm up to about 60 percent by the end of the Bloomberg years, right? Yeah, and, it, and that is a tremendous education policy success, which we should be really proud of. Of course, what are they prepared to do when they graduate? That's another whole question, and there were just stats out sure. this week about, I think, something like 80 percent of New York City high school grads who then go on to CUNY Community College need some kind of remediation. Sure. Um, so that's a complicated issue. I mean, either Either way, the kids who graduated from high school are going to be more likely to live longer on average. They're going to be more likely to stay married. They're going to be more likely to have a range of positive outcomes of, for their children. So that all may be true, but I think we should also kind of give them their due on that. So that's all by way of background. Yep. Edu Wonkett, we will put that in a bubble, mm -hmm. a time capsule for the moment, and move on to the present study, which had to do with teacher behavior in Houston. Yes. What did you look at? Um, so this study, um, you know, builds on a debate in the literature that's trying to understand how teachers respond when we use proficiency rates to evaluate them. So you can imagine one scenario in which teachers say, these are the kids who are closest to passing. If I just help them get one or two more questions right, I can push them over that threshold and in doing so really increase passing rates a lot, but nothing really changed, right? It's not that the top or the bottom move very much. So this is trying to intervene in that debate, which has been going on for like, oh my gosh, you know, five or ten years at this point in this literature, and some people have found increases um, in, you know, 
kids' performance across the test score distribution. Some people have found increases only in certain parts. Some people have found increases on some tests and not others. So this, this is really trying to bring all of those ideas together to understand um, kind of what's really going on. Do we care who gets attention for test prep, or is the problem that there's just so much test prep? Yeah, so, um, so when we started this study, I think my perspective, so this is with Hiju San, who's a doctoral student at Penn, and it's phenomenal. Um, I have to say that to those two sentences, but when we started, I was thinking if these inequalities didn't generalize to the second test that we look at, which is a similar, it's what we're calling a low stakes test, so it's similar content, but there aren't incentives around it for teachers to really focus on teaching kids the little details. Then we thought, oh, then this triage thing that I had spent a lot of time studying in the past, maybe it doesn't matter at all. Um, but then, you know, the reviewers on this paper really pushed us to think hard about the ways in which high stakes tests are used to um, assign kids to particular classes, to sort kids in different ways in their educational trajectory. So it still matters, I think, even if it's just test prep. It may not matter for our cognitive skills, but it matters for both you know, individual kids' longer term trajectories and for the policy stories that we tell, right? So we've told a range of policy stories based on high stakes tests in the city in particular and across the country that um, don't, you know, replicate when we look at other outcomes. And, and those are kind of two different sets of effects these tests have. And this has to do with tracking students, in effect, through teacher behavior? Um, so that, that is one way um, of thinking about it. That's one way that it could affect the future. It could affect individual kids' perceptions of themselves. Um, and it could affect their parents' perceptions of their performance. There's a terrific study by John Pape and colleagues that ends up finding that getting right above um, the advanced level versus right below, so there's really no difference between these kids, makes you much more likely to go to college, um, which is, is really stunning, and it's kind of the Pygmalion effect, um, you know, in, in practice. How did you measure in your study mm -hmm. this triage, teachers deciding not to pay attention to some kids? Sure so they could pay attention to those who were just barely, sure. maybe going to pass if they got a lot of attention. Yeah, so I should say we're not measuring teacher behavior. We're trying to, to kind of infer teacher behavior from what happens with the test score. So there are two different tests. There's what we call the high stakes test. That's the state test that teachers and schools are held accountable for. This other test, the low stakes test, um, for which they're not held accountable, but really similar content. We look at different parts of the test score distribution, so really low performing kids, middle performing kids, and high performing kids, um, and use the fact that for idiosyncratic reasons, um, the state set the cut rate, the kind of place you have to jump over to pass, very differently on the reading and math test in Texas, which really gave us an opportunity to see what happens when we set the cut point really low, so almost all kids pass, and then what happens when we set it really high. So what we find is big implications for this Common Core debate, because when you set um, this proficiency bar low, you end up creating incentives to focus on the lowest performing kids, and that may be something that we want to have happen. When you set it high, you create incentives to focus closer to that part of the distribution. Um, but it's a paradox, right? Because if you set paradox. the bar low, mm -hmm. then everybody's going to pass, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily going to be educated. Right, right. So I think that the bigger picture thing here is that we need to get over proficiency as the be-all, end-all measure in education. I think the public is smart enough to be able to handle um, a more complex way of reporting educational performance, and we could avoid a lot of these um, you know, pitfalls. If so it's just what? Elevating what? that we have de-emphasized too much? Oh, in terms of what other outcomes? Or I was even thinking with, with respect to test scores in terms uh -huh. of just reporting, not this proficiency rate, did you jump over a line or not? Uh -huh. um, but certainly it's the case that there's a wide range of outcomes like you know your college success, your how much money you earn in the long term, whether or not you get arrested, um, whether or not you vote. There's a, a whole set of outcomes that we currently don't measure that are really the goal of the public education. It's sad because the whole point, I thought, or one of the biggest points mm -hmm. of no child left behind mm -hmm. was to leave no child behind, was sure. to not declare a school a success mm -hmm. unless the poorest students and a large percentage of minority students mm -hmm. were proficient sure. in reading and math, in addition to the kids who might come in with greater advantages. Mm -hmm. And yet you're saying it backfires. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that what 
No Child Left Behind did was draw attention to those issues and I think it, it did a good job in that regard, but it, it certainly hasn't reduced educational inequality um, in any meaningful way. Um, so yeah, there, there are still children left behind. That's where we are today. Complicated world. That's right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. That's public intellectual for this week. Next, we go to Queens, where park advocates and cyclists want to turn a three and a half acre stretch of abandoned Long Island Railroad tracks into a High Line-like park, you know the High Line in Manhattan, dubbed the Queensway. At the same time, the idea of reactivating train service along the line is gaining steam. Some say build both, and others say build nothing at all. Rail, trail, or both, or none of the above, the debate is far from settled. Recently, the Friends of the Queensway gave a bike tour of the line that runs from Rigo Park to Ozone Park. Producer Shannon Ayala went along for the ride. I'm here because I think the Queensway is a great idea. It would be wonderful to have a real path in Queens. I like the idea of having a park and a bicycle path. And also it would be a great way to link all the neighborhoods, which is really not that easy to do anymore. Down in that gully, down in this ravine, is where the old Rockway Beach Branch line used to run. As you can see in this location, there's a really steep gully down there. The last time a train ran down there was 60 years ago. Wow. This is where it begins. This is where you would start on the trail, and then you'd have a three and a half mile clean shot all the way down to Ozone Park. But uh, we feel, at least our organization, the Institute for Rational Urban Mobility, feels that the right of way is wide enough to accommodate both a rail plus a trail. It just need, and it would need a fleet of rail cars that is comfortable on the air train and on the Long Island Railroad. Uh, and this would produce a very high speed, high quality rail link between Penn Station and ultimately Grand Central to Kennedy Airport. This whole space used to be a train switching yard for the Rockaway Beach branch line. Uh, 40 or so years ago, the, the Youth Association was able to purchase the yard, but the right of way at the top of the embankment, that's still owned by the city of New York. What is it, about 10 acres worth of parkland? That's, that's right along this stretch. Some glimpses of the Long Island Railroad Rockaway Beach Branch Line also known as the Queensway, here to give us a fuller picture of the plans and the rail versus trail debate are Travis Terry, a spokesman for Friends of the Queensway, and George Hykalis, president of the Institute for Rational Urban Mobility. All right, which one of you is the bike guy? Uh, I'm the bike uh, park, transportation, everything guy. Uh, I'm the Queensway guy. What do you want to do with this space? Well, you know, we, I am a Forest Hills resident. And I think what's, uh, what's really sort of interesting about the space is for about 52 years, there's been three and a half miles of linear land that has been unused and has now become a dumping ground. It's urban blight. It's uh, full of junk and litter. And, and it's I an said, attractive I said three and a half acres in the introduction. Ah, That's sure. a mistake. It's really, it's three and a half miles of straight. S straight, yep. Um, former railroad. Bed. Former railroad. It, it's actually, it's 47 acres. Uh, okay. 46.8 to be exact, from what I understand. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of us in the community decided uh, after 50 years of abandonment and just seeing the type of trash and litter and the criminal activity that's going on up there that it's time to take take and take uh, take lead and try to do something special with it and we've seen the um, uh, we've seen what the success of the High Line and what a number of other rails to trails projects have brought to their communities and decided we're going to team up and uh, it was people from Fars Hills from Woodhaven from Ozone Park Richmond Hill etc 
um, who decided that we want to convert this into a park and community amenity. And I think what gets lost a little bit in the debate is the, the point of community and cultural amenity. Because what that means is that there could be transportation uses for this, things like bike and pedestrians. There's 12 schools that now exist within a five minute walk of the Queensway. There's two little leagues. Uh, it is a, uh, and one park, in fact, uh, Forest uh, Park is uh, seven acres of the Queensway exists with right within Forest Park. Big park. The portion of, uh, portion of the Queensway that's actually below grade, whereas the other right. portions are above grade. And so um, I'm going to cut you off there for yeah, just a sure. moment. And there's the beginning of a vision yeah. of what it might be used for. And here's a little bit visually yeah, very proud of this. that represents the kind of thing that you hope this is going to look like, yeah. right? Exactly. It was, um, as community advocates, we also realized at some point that as much as enthusiasm matters, we really needed to bring in the experts. And uh, we've been fortunate uh, not only to have the community excitement, but to bring in a par great partner in the Trust for Public Land which is the nation's leading creator of parks throughout the country. I don't and see the bikes there. Those pedestrians are going to have to move over. Yeah, well, if you can look at the top, you can see one bike. You can see the bikers on the top. This is, a, this is an effort to actually make sure that the, uh, the, the biking path and the walking path oh, are somewhat separated. They have their own lanes. Yeah, because we're going to have... We, we and on two different levels, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, we envision this to be a very kid-friendly, age-friendly, yes. family-friendly okay. uh, aspect. So you'll see All right. people with strollers. You're the and train other. guy. Yes, sir. What do you envision? Well, I, th I think that uh, this is a wonderful railroad. Any city in the world that had a, a, a high-speed rail line, like you pointed out, was almost a straight line. The Manhattan Central Business District, the, the nation's largest business district by far. A Kennedy Airport, the nation's busiest international airport. And here's a railroad right between them that's sitting there fa fallow for uh, uh, 50 years, 50 two years, 53 years. It was part of the LIRR? And it, was it went a, from Ozone Park to Rigo Park? It was on its way to the Rockaways. When the uh, Rockaway Peninsula, with, with its beautiful beaches, uh, uh, as it, the city grew and the population in Brooklyn and Manhattan was growing, the people wanted to get to the beaches to enjoy the, uh, uh, the fine uh, 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 recreational facilities there. And it was a private enterprise. The railroad was built by the uh, Long Island Railroad built this branch as part of its overall system. The Long Island is basically built about connecting beaches to Manhattan. So this is part of that same concept. But nobody's used it in close to a hundred years? No, 50, 50, uh, 62 was the last at this. 1962. 1962. And uh, I, I arrived in New York in 1963. So it was not because of my arrival that it was <laughs> taken out of service, but, but one of the things we've been... Just so you wouldn't be able to ride it. That's right. <laughs> but, but do people really need this to be able to go from central Queens to southeastern Queens by reconstituting a defunct railroad line? I mean, they're having trouble enough building the, the, you know, the core infrastructure of getting the LIR into Grand Central, for example. Mm -hmm. Is this the place to spend the money? This is a existing railroad that the viaducts, the uh, embankments are all in place with one uh, uh, underpass, overpass that, that was taken out. It's an asset. It's a, uh, you know, it's not just we're starting from scratch and here's a crayola and we're putting a uh, railroad here. This is a railroad that functioned for uh, whatever number of years, 70 some years. Uh, what happens in New York is when the city was expanded into all five boroughs, uh, the, the city's enthusiasm to connect the boroughs with subways uh, led to a, a bureaucracy, uh, a, a worthwhile one, that was very good at building subways. And we have all the IRT and IND and so forth. And the Long Island Railroad was sort of outside of their realm because that was a, a private railroad and you know, finally bankrupt and finally became a public railroad. So it, it was... Um, uh, this was going to be part of the subway system. It was going to be an, a branch of this Queen's Express that was to be built to relieve the overcrowding on the E and F train, which is still overcrowded. It's very ter okay. a very tough line. And so this would have provided relief. But we had these worlds of railroads are one thing and subways are another thing. And uh, the rest of the world, in fact, has moved on. In London, in Paris, in uh, Berlin, they have what they call regional rail lines. 
they have a central fare zone where you pay the same fare whether you're using a railroad or using a subway, you just go from A to B. So let me jump in and ask you both yes, sir. if we can have both. I no. have friends who bike over the Manhattan Bridge every day next to the train. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, we don't see that as being a, a possibility, and I'll give you a couple reasons why. First of all, it requires rail, and rail has been studied on multiple occasions and found to be infeasible because of its high cost, uh, because of its, the quality of life and environmental damage that would occur from it, and because of the fact that uh, actually now uh, the, the portion that will exist in Forest Park is now actually been uh, is now actually parkland where it wasn't uh, 50 years ago. So that means you have to go through a very complicated process. Um, so just uh, just starting from the point of actually being able to activate this for rail seems to be uh, very implausible. Um, even beyond that, when you go up there and as you can see from some of the images you've showed, it's not that wide. So to try to have a situation where you have a rail running next to what we really want to do is create an environment that is you know, very heavy kids friendly and provide opportunities for our kids because there's a sort of dearth of open space, there's inaccessibility to uh, Forest Park um, to provide additional transportation via bike and pedestrians, safer routes to our schools and to our little leagues. Um, it's just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like a, a realistic option here. Um, and that's not to take anything away from, from the desire for And are you arguing that it can be mixed use in this respect? I think it can be done with good design and, and it could cover, it can serve both. I, I think it's clear that the rail people, which is to not have a trail and you know, bothering them, and the trail people would not like to have a rail. So it's a compromise. Uh, obviously, if you're going to fit both in, each one is going to be a little bit less than what you'd ideally like. But I, I, and there has been no real uh, careful analysis of the rail plus trail as an option. The, the, uh, uh, the firm that's doing this work for the uh, advocacy group, uh, actually uh, the uh, architectural firm, uh, is well aware of our plans and has never really been commissioned to look at both. No one has been commissioned to look at both. So what we would like the governor to do is to put the resources, now that there's study going on the trail, to looking at both so that this could be done at the side by side and we could have a serious discussion of what the trade-offs are in that compromise. You also have a situation too, Brian, where you, uh, the, the rail actually runs just directly, I mean the, the old tracks run sort of just directly next to schools and right through uh, the Forest Hills Little League. So you would have a very difficult time in, uh, in addition to all the logistical complications associated with what's been studied on rail with trying to convince all of Central and Southern Queens to accept something like this, whereas you have this other option. Um, that has just a huge amount of public benefit and we're starting to see some of the findings from our study now just as it relates to improving commute times and uh, safer streets. Ha and has anybody done real polling of the neighbors along the way and whether they'd rather have more train cars or more park space? Uh, we, we actually commissioned, the Trust of Public Land actually commissioned a poll just to get general sense of the neighborhood and I think over it's like over, if I remember correctly, this, over 70% of the people um, really desired the Queensway. And if, as you got actually closer to the areas where the Queensway was, it actually jumped up even higher. That's their poll. Do you have your poll? We, don't, we haven't had the resources that they've had. But basically, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Kennedy Airport is the second largest uh, source of employment in Queens. People work there. They're dependent on that uh, airport being a functional, attractive place. Cities around the world have built high-speed rail links to their airports. You've got the train to the plane from Jamaica now, right? Well, we have two trains. One, uh, we take a train to Jamaica and then we switch to another train to the airport. Where we, whereas we have a right-of-way that could produce a, a world-class railroad for uh, airport passengers. Now, maybe we don't want it. Maybe we don't want uh, New York to compete with the other cities around the world. But we, that has to be part of the discussion. It's not right now. Who decides and when? <laughs> well, it's city-owned property, so presumably the city of New York will. Uh, but you said the make governor. The governor is putting money into this uh, study of the trail. He's not putting any money into the study of a rail. The MTA could easily, and the Port Authority could work together and do the put the remaining resource to at least study it. Right. And so it's a question of whether we want 
good access to the airport or not. Or maybe as we learned with pre-K and charter schools, the city says what it intends to do <laughs> and then the state tells it what it will do. There you go. Right. 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 There for today. Thank you both very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you Brian. Much. And that's our program for this week. You will find a new show here each week at this hour. Next time, talking or not talking race in the workplace. And do tune in to my radio program weekday mornings at 10 a.m. on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM820. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.